It's you. 1865 was the first book, Alice in Wonderland, and there was nothing like it ever before. I mean, in terms of words and characters. <laughs> Find out! The, the idea was to explore the nature of, of dreams. There's a collection of outsiders, and particularly Alice. The opportunity to see the marriage of Tim Burton and Alice in Wonderland is a, a real treat. There's a lot of pressure in a way when you're playing such an iconic character. The hard thing is stripping away all the baggage that comes with her being Alice in Wonderland and just finding Alice. Come back to me and just sort of hold your look back to that. Okay. Yeah. One of the reasons why Alice and Tim are such a great match is because nothing is exactly as it seems in Wonderland. Nothing is entirely good or entirely bad. He's always had a compassion, I guess, and been drawn to outsiders. I think it's quite tricky for Tim because he said they're all mad. So you have, we all have to make them mad in a different way. <laughs> It falls somewhere in between an adaptation and a retelling, but it incorporates a lot of the original characters and themes of the storybooks. A lot of the book is Alice trying to figure out who she isn't by process of elimination. In the Tim Burton Alice in Wonderland, Alice is trying to name who she is. The idea of Wonderland is kind of in a surreal way, representative of some way, shape, or form issues that she's dealing with in her own life. I think I'm going mad. I keep seeing a rabbit in a waistcoat. The beginning of the film is so important for establishing Alice's character. You know, it really has to set up a lot in such a short space of time of who she is before she goes to Wonderland. She's very close with her dad, who unfortunately dies, but you don't, obviously you don't get to see all that bit. Her grief really unlocks her awkwardness and her uncomfortableness with the society that she lives in. You're not the same as you were before. There's a great line in it where the Mad Hatter says, you seem like Alice, but you've lost your muchness. My muchness? I'm there. Well, I think in the storybooks, Alice does have a lot of muchness. She's, you know, she won't be told anything that, you know, that doesn't sit well with her. And this story is her, you know, finding her muchness again. When it comes to accessing what her character would be like, I can draw a lot from what I'm experiencing as a teenager. Society expects me to be an adult in certain ways that I'm uncomfortable with. She's on that, the cusp of being between a child and a woman. In one minute, she looks so much like a child. And then the next, she's most definitely a woman. So that was so important to Tim, to find someone who was on that cusp. She captured the spirit of what we try to do with Alice, you know, as a character, sort of internal, quiet strength, emotionally tough but beautiful. For me, she really captured the voice of what Alice is and what that character is. Mia's not an obvious Alice at all, but at the same time, she's the only choice, really. She's just perfect for it. Use the curtains if you must, but close this enormous girl. I thought I would have like one costume maybe, but it kind of turned out to be, I think six or something like that. I start off in like the kind of the classic blue dress for the party. We played around with other colors, but we came back to blue because it just seemed the right thing and it also looked really pretty on Mia. You ruined the surprise. Because she's not a child, we just sort of did the teen version of Alice. It's only a dream. When I shrink for the first time in the round room, I end up wearing an undergarment, which I tie around my waist and so that it fits me somewhat. At the tea party, when I shrink again, the hatter makes me a dress. It's out of a bit of her original under thing. So we had to really think out how all that worked together and make different scales of, of fabric and stuff to make it work with the, you know, shrinking and growing of Alice. But once it started working, then we sort of just did it and we had a lot more creativity with it. Why don't you slay the Jabberwocky yourself? It's been so much more physical than I ever imagined. Yeah, you know, and Tim really likes that energy. Yeah, yeah. Apart from fighting a dragon-esque creature, the big deal for her is regaining her strength. When Alice embraces her strength, the queen is able to reclaim her throne. They both kind of reclaim their power and are changed by Alice's courage. We have our champion. 
her experience in Wonderland is her finding herself again and finding that she, you know, has the strength to be even more self-assured. Oh, my God! I love it. I love the main message of this in that it's an emotional journey for Alice. You're terribly late, you know, naughty. In this version of Alice, the Hatter was, I mean, in my mind, he's mad. I think he's been sitting there at that table having the same tea with the same people in this kind of spaced out funk for 10 years. I think he's been frozen in time, waiting for Alice to come back. I had read stuff about real hatters when they were making the hats. The glue that they used had very high mercury content and it would stain their hands and they would go sideways. You know, they'd go goofy from the mercury and uh, go nuts. And so it did happen to people. They went mad as a hatter. It is good to be working at my trade again. <laughs> the Hatter's entire body was affected by the mercury, by the madness, so much so that his, his clothes, his skin color, his hair, everything reflects his emotion. And that's, I mean, that's just stuff that just felt right. Cockle hat, pork pie, billy cock, demo o' shanta. Yeah, a real challenge, you know, to define the Mad Hatter in terms of cinema, in terms of film. It's risky stuff. <laughs> Like with any character, you get these, you know, I always get these sort of images, you know, I, I get this, start seeing the guy, you know. For something as wild as it was, it, it all happened pretty organically. I, I started making my little, you know, like I always do little watercolors and stuff. You know, Tim is halfway across the globe and uh, he's making his little drawings. And we spoke about it and compared it, they weren't very far off. His actually was a little better than mine. Uh, you know, uh, mine was crude, his was crude, but that's the fun part, you know, coming up with. The scary part is when you actually see it. So what I did is I took that illustration and uh, sort of translated it onto his face, you know, using his features. The wig, you know, we had this electric orange yak hair that <laughs> just kind of, you know, had its own personality. We did start exploring every orange-haired character, and it's quite disturbing when you do that. I wanted him to have electrified kind of eyes, you know, so uh, we got these unbelievably green lenses and had one of them painted just ever so slightly off, you know, so that's kind of... He's never really looking straight at you. He's always looking a little bit farther. Initially, when Tim was uh, drawing all, a lot of the concepts and little sketches, for various characters like um, the Mad Hatter or the Red Queen. He has an artistic style where he actually draws characters with big heads and big eyes. And so what we did was end up uh, saying, you know what, let's take some footage and let's blow up Johnny Depp's eyes and see what that adds to his character and see what that looks like. And so those enlarged eyes are one just subtle thing that help uh, bridge the gap between these fully CG characters and real people. It's not a motion capture representation. When you see Johnny's performance, it's him. It's his eyes, it's his face, it's everything. He's got an amazing costume with, his, um, with all the ribbons and the, um, the bobbins. I thought it would be cool if, I mean, we talked about him having all the tools of his trade apparent so they aren't just on a shelf, but they're part of his costume, and like little scissors things, and he's got his thimbles, which were an early idea, and his pincushion ring, and all these things. We just kept pushing it, and, and it was great fun to make him all his bits and stuff. The original hat was sort of done before the drawings, but it was what they both kind of saw. Action! Take it to the White Queen. I'm not leaving without you. No! When I first saw him in all his hair and makeup, he was so unrecognizable that it was just like he was just the character from the beginning. This is impossible. Only if you believe it is. When he leaves the trailer, when his costume goes on, it's complete, but he is the Mad Hatter. I mean, he's gone from Johnny Depp to the Mad Hatter. Snood, Babouche, Pougri, Yamaka, Cockle Hat, Pork Pie, Tamashanta, Billy Cock, Bicon, Tricon, Bando, Bon Grace, Fanta, Nightcat, Get Wally Fans. When I heard him do a scene for the first time, I, I loved everything that he had done with um, the very innocent, very hopeful, almost you know puppy dog-like thing that he was doing with, uh, with one part of the Mad Hatter. Twinkle, twinkle, little bat, how I wonder where you're at. 
And then I thought that I, I was hearing things because then I was on set another day and suddenly he had fire in his eyes and was doing a Scottish accent. And I assumed that he must have been rehearsing something for another movie. And then I found out, no, when he's very much in the present, he's sweet. And then when he's remembering the past, he's, you know, Scottish. That is an excellent practice. However, just at the moment, you really might want to focus on the Jabberwock. And, you know, it's one of those things where it's hit or miss, you know, and you just hope that, you know, that, that, it's, that it works. I mean, the accents, the, you know, the switching, it's, it's the uh, merging into another uh, character, basically, is the Hatter's sort of, you know, that safety mechanism that kicks in when he needs to become tough, when he needs to become angry, when he needs to be protective, when he's fearful. It's kind of like experiencing a kinder form of personality disorder, in a way. What is the hatter with me? But to cut the combination of being able to play the Mad Hatter and breathe life into that and kind of take what Lewis Carroll has done and what Tim's vision is and then throw your own stuff in there. You know, it's just like the stuff dreams are made of. You first. Come on. Futter whacking. Futter whacking. Futter whacking. Futter what? Futter whacking. It was really hard at the beginning to kind of pinpoint what the futter whacking was exactly. Come on, you know what futter whacking is. It was the funnest word to say in the story. It's a dance. <laughs> Listen, we've all futter whacked sometime, I'm sure. I shall futter whacking vigorously. <laughs> Tim and Johnny had a running joke that the last film, Johnny sang, now he's gonna make him dance. I was so freaked out by the very idea of futter whacking and the possibility of having to do it in a large green room in front of a bunch of grown-ups. I tried firing a gun at his feet a few times, you know, like in the old westerns, but I think he'd rather have his foot shot off, to be honest, than have to dance. Tim, at first, started speaking with some choreographers to see how to approach creating the photo act and dance. He soon realized that the best approach was to find someone who can dance in an extraordinary way. And I said to Tim, have you seen this guy on YouTube? There's several clips of me on the internet, what they call viral clips, and you know they're seen by millions of people. I showed Tim the clip of David dancing, and Tim said, exactly, that's exactly the kind of thing we need to find. We then went forward to try to find him uh, on MySpace, of all places. He lives 40 minutes away in Orange County. He showed some of his moves to Tim, and uh, sure enough, David and Johnny were exactly the same height. And I think that's when Tim realized that maybe Johnny didn't actually have to learn these amazing moves. Tim got worried for me, I think, <laughs> and uh, spared me the mortification. Yeah, he, he, he brought in a professional futter whacker. Tim Burton gave me a lot of freedom to do what I pretty much wanted to do. I mean, he showed me some reference footage, but it wasn't very specific. I didn't really know what he wanted, you know? So I kind of just freestyled in front of him. He liked it, you know? And then the second time, I did something completely different, and he liked that one too. So I just figured, all right, he just wants me to dance. Some of the moves that I'm known for are my fluidity. I make my whole body basically look like it's made out of water. I can also do a lot of animalistic type movements, and I almost look like some kind of alien creature. It's kind of weird, like the Mad Hatter. It almost fits that costume. Johnny Depp didn't really say anything to me about like how I should move. I saw him doing some hand gestures, and that's one of the things I do too. So I like kind of incorporated some of my hand gestures and kind of made that more uh, of a centerpiece. I did less of the traditional hopping, break dancing style. I tried to make it a little bit more timeless, a little bit more non-period, like something that you couldn't really recognize from anywhere. I think people will be a little surprised. It's beautiful. He's an amazing dancer. I mean. Maybe we shouldn't tell that to the people at home, but uh, another man photo whacked for me. There, I said it. I need to pick here. 
I love a warm pig belly for my aching feet. There was one quote which was really useful that Lewis Carroll wrote, something he wrote about the Red Queen and saying he saw her, somebody who was afflicted with an ungovernable passion and just this fury and this rage. She basically has no heart, even though she's a queen of hearts. The Queen of Hearts in Wonderland and through the looking glass, there's the Red Queen and White Queen. Hello, Arras. And I'm an amalgam of the Red Queen and the Queen of Hearts. I really thought I was not going to be in it at all. I, I thought we were definitely give ourselves a break, you know. And as usual, I was the last person to find out that in fact I was the Queen of Hearts. And Tim sort of said like, well, of course you're going to play the Queen. Look, this is the first drawing I did. And there was this picture of a really angry person. <laughs> and I said, oh yeah. And then he said, look, all the artists even drew you, and there's this horrible picture of this really old hag, like with a big head, going mm -hmm. like that. I mean, it was hilarious reading the script and coming across character description, you know, but it wasn't flattering, but I thought, yes. And Tim, anyway, said, I just have this feeling that you like to disguise yourself. And I said, you're too right. Fat boys! Ah, oh, there they are. Aren't they adorable? They have the oddest way of speaking. Speak, boys, amuse us. She was perfect. She was perfect. And, and very patient, man, you know. There was a tremendous amount of makeup time, you know, that she had to do. It takes her, you know, three, four hours every day to get into that hair and makeup. She, we, we all come in a bit later. She's there at 4.30 every single day. So I'm in the chair by five, and I get I have my hair pasted down. They wrap me up in a cocoon, and I have a hot water bottle, and I get to sleep and lie down. And then they start painting me. It takes another 40 minutes for me to paint the makeup on her which is putting eyebrows on, the eyelashes, blue, and the lips, and skin coloration. And then I wake up like a bald alien, really unattractive. Sometimes I can rehearse like that, and Tim doesn't want to have anything to do with me. And then on top of it, I've got this glorious red wig. Because they wanted this hairstyle to be two or three times bigger than Helena's, Helena's own head. You, know, you don't just get an actor in a chair and stick a wig on and thank you goodbye. There's a lot of discussion with them before, during, and after about the style that it's in and colors that suit and, and making it live, making it look like their own. I think it helps the artists with their performance. No! It is my crown! I'm the eldest! Jabberwocky! I was so relieved that I got a costume on this. Um, because at first it was going to be a green leotard, which I thought, I am not going to be able to be queen, i.e. have some sense of authority, you know, and command in a green leotard. Well, the Red Queen's approach was always driven partially by what had to happen with the size of her head and, and that. So we sort of organized her costume quite early and did, did some tricks with that to shave in the waist to make it look extremely smaller and make a kind of bigger skirt and smaller shoulders to make the head look bigger. And then we rework the collar several times to get it you know, satisfactory for what the animators needed to do with the costume. I based it on a bit of the heart theme and also a sort of graphic sort of lift from playing cards, but trying to not make it too much like a playing card made into a dress. I had this idea when he first said I was going to do Alice in Wonderland. I thought, oh, think of all the props we're going to get to keep. We were thinking about what the Red Queen would need. And so we thought, well, all queens or kings have a scepter, at least a scepter. And so we started to design one just in case. We came up with a series of designs, set all the stones, did all the, the cutting by hand in the handle. Each pin is screwed and tapped and pressure fits onto the stone. It's actually really an engineering feat. I always carry around just to remind everybody that I am queen. And then I put a crown. I've got lovely spectacles, my idea. Pink ones to play croquet with. I always have lots of pops. Action! Off with her head! The big hazard of playing the Queen of Hearts is because she shouts a lot, I mostly did not have a voice. He tried to kill me! He tried to kill me! I lost my voice pretty much every day. Prepare the Jabberwocky for battle. We're going to visit my little sister. It's quite exhausting losing your temper all the time. And it's really exhausting shouting. Look such a dumb bird! She is unafraid of being this incredibly demonic character. I think what's funny about it is, is she's doing it in a little kind of baby doll way. 
I love the way she plays a character. She plays her like a kind of petulant child, like a girl playing queen. Where are my fat boys? You must meet them. Fat boys! It's villainous, but at the same time, you can't help but like her. She just doesn't take very much. In fact, it takes nothing practically for her to lose her temper. The Red Queen has something growing in her head. Um, it's sort of pressing on her brain, which makes her a little irritable. So she's always threatening to cut people's heads off. Her <laughs> name is Um, you idiot. Sit. Sit! What if I take off your head? Will you know then? I do a kind of a posh accent. I do a weak R to make her a bit more childlike, I guess. It has been really, really fun. I love being royal. I love my fat boys. Now, get out! I'm gonna miss being queen. My makeup, it takes about three hours. I've been saying four, just for sympathy, but I guess realistically, it, it takes about two and a half hours in the morning. A successful makeup is something that is a collaboration with the actor because they make that character come alive. There were a bunch of different drawings of the Red Queen. I sat down with Helena for an afternoon and sort of played with some different things. I had a meeting with Tim and he pinpointed the things he wanted and we took some things from some of the looks I'd done on Helena and then put it together with certain things that he wanted. It's basically a weird cartoon version of Elizabeth I, so they've taken my eyebrows away and given me a high forehead, so I have a, a bald cap that extends from underneath my eyelids right across my head. There's a certain trust, because you take, you know, with all these actors, not only the performance, but you're saying, okay, you're gonna change the way they look, so it's nice when people are open to that. Tim, he loves theatrical makeup. I mean, if you look at Fellini movies, everyone is just, makeup is exaggerated. I mean, the characters are exaggerated. I think it's great. During a film, they never really shoot in sequence. So you basically have to be able to repeat anything you do many times, and it's got to look exactly the same. We have to make notes on pretty much everything we do and take pictures so that it matches. With her eyebrows, since they're like pencil thin, I decided to make a stencil. So every day, I just have to line it up and then, you know, draw inside the little cutouts. There's a bit of clown in there. I mean, both me and Johnny have got clown elements, white, white makeup, as usual. And I got my lips are perfect, or these little, this little heart. It's a bow mouth, but it kind of makes her really mean, too, because she's got a tiny little heart. So, yeah, it's a strong look. So much has gone now to CGI and animation, so it's kind of nice to actually be hands-on and actually doing the makeups, and they're actually filming the makeups. It's nothing that's been put on afterward. I love creating looks like this. Like, I could just be in a room all day with people and just come up with different things and just make people up and make them into different things. I mean, I love doing that. 91, take one, marker. And action! Who will step forth to be champion for the White Queen? I play the White Queen. Would you all excuse me for a moment? In a way, she's kind of one of Alice's only allies. Where's your champion, sister? Here. She gets a really pretty dress. She's invented a kind of a daffy character. Buttered fingers. When I first came on board with the project, Tim talked a lot about the relationship between the sisters. And that really opened the character up to me a lot because I thought, all right, she comes from the same gene pool as the Red Queen. Hello, Erasmus. Hello, Miwana. You've got your good queen and your bad queen, but it's Wonderland, so everybody's a bit off. So I thought, okay, so what way are they similar? And I just realized that my character actually really likes the idea of violence, really likes weapons, really likes the dark side, but she's so scared of going too far into it because she saw her sister do that, that she's kind of made everything appear very light and happy. Arasi, we don't have to fight. She is a very, like, you know, airy, lovey, zen character, but she also kind of has this malice to her, almost like she could lash out at any moment. Yeah. 
passion? Why don't you slay the Jabwalki yourself? It is against my vows to harm any living creature. <laughs> it was fun to kind of explore the slightly off side of somebody who's supposed to be good. That's great. Let's do one more. Oh. Your crimes against Andalin are worthy of death. Okay. Anne Hathaway has very dark hairs, and the White Queen has white hair. So underneath her wig, I've done a bald skin so that through the parting area of the wig, you can't see anything except what you think is her scalp. And the style for that wig, just a long, wavy style, a common theme in Tim's films, to have the women with that long, wavy hair. The armor is complete. For the makeup, I had to wait till the wig went on her. I wanted to use sort of more like violet or lavender, or purple, and sort of a purplish blue. We just played around till we found what was right. All of a sudden, when we did that look on her, she loved it. And then she felt that was the right thing for her character. So she was like, I hope Tim likes it. And he did. Colleen made this dress that has so much detail to it, that's so com complex, but it doesn't look at all heavy. The White Queen is sort of the Beverly Hills version of the Red Queen, in fact. She's a bit more tightly round, a lot of jewelry on her clothes, a lot of a little bit of sparkle. I noticed the way the dress moved when, when I was in it. It was never my intention to create a, a, per a perfect light. I just kind of wanted her to arrive in certain places, and in my head, I just thought the way she walks, she occasionally bumps into things and kind of doesn't know how she got there. And she's a little dopey and, and kind of ditzy, but at the same time, very, very clued in. And I noticed that when I was creating the glide, the more I did with my arms, the more languid I could make my arms, I noticed the more it did look like I was gliding. That's kind of when the Norma Desmond thing happened. I don't know. <laughs> But it was her taking these little tiny steps, and the dress was stationary, so it looked like she was on a, on a roller. She kind of floats like uh, someone you'd see in a Dracula movie. She's certainly not doing it for vanity, because I don't think anyone will know it's Anne Hathaway unless they read the credits. Come with me. Annie was very sure about what she wanted to do with it. She's not played it. It could so easily be the good white doll queen, and she's um, brought a kind of her own madness to it, too. Good. She did such a great job, I man. It's such a weird performance. It actually made me jealous. I wanted to play the white queen. I love my character. I really had a lot of fun playing around with this idea that what's good in Wonderland is not necessarily good in the real world. I had a lot of fun with her as good. <laughs> that should do it. If you diverge from the path. I make the path. Because it's Alice in Wonderland, as a composer, you go, all right, there's definitely going to be some fun stuff in here. That should do it. But at the same time, Tim tempered it with, and it's going to be one of the hardest jobs we've ever done together. Tim's ear is really very specific. People think that we have some kind of miracle shorthand but we really don't talk about it until we have stuff in front of us, until I can play him stuff, and then he can react. And then based on his reaction, I start to fine tune it and fine tune it from there. So just 14, 15, it's the little, little swell at the end. On all of our films together, there's a, a process we have to go through, and there's a bit of a road that sometimes means circling around and doubling back. It's never a straight line, it's never that simple. The one thing I do know Tim well enough to know that there's nothing I can't play him. Knowing that, I'll, I'll try pretty much anything. I've lost my muchness, have I? I was in my second or third presentation with Tim, and I was already laying out melodies and themes, and there was this odd one, and he immediately gravitated to it. He goes, what's that? Play that part again. It's what evolved into Alice's heroic theme. In fact, it was for the longest time, it was just called Hero. I mean, it always had this melody, da 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 and the da da was always in my head, Alice. And I told Tim, I said, you know, the orchestra is saying Alice every time. He said, just go and record some stuff that I might use or cut or, or have that's not to picture, called Wild Tracks. So I love doing that, and that's where I have the most fun. So I wrote Alice Hero Wild. And I actually then had the choir sing in it, and I had them go, oh, Alice. But while I was sitting 
in the airport before I came home. I was listening to it on my headphones. I said, I don't know why, but I should write lyrics. I'm just hearing, oh, Alice, dear, where have you been? I just had to do it. I was compelled to do it. I wanted the boys to be singing the theme because it comes from a more innocent place, the sound of their voices, because their sound is less precise. It sounds a little more naive, a little more innocent, a little earthier to me, to my ear. It became my favorite piece. I really do think as a composer, especially a composer of big films, you have to like hold on to yourself and you have to lose yourself at the same time. This is a very personal thing for Tim. Each of the dozen movies I've worked with him on, I've got to follow him into a different place and it's always been really interesting because I never know where I'm gonna go with him. So it's kind of like, he's my guide. Are they always this way? Following him on this one was particularly delightful. It's such a, it a very strange and interesting place. What tonight wasn't a dream at all. This place is real. It was important that they felt like they were both in the real and unreal world at the same time. Well, this is a, a very unique project. Um, I've been in visual effects for a long time, and to have a project like this where you're throwing so many different disciplines into one project makes it that much more fun and unique. We have some of our characters that are full live action characters. We have some characters that are regular keyframe animations, so just traditional CG characters, the March Hare, the Dormouse, the Cheshire Cat, and then there are some hybrid characters. This uh, way of making the film makes it complicated because you now have to blend elements of live action, CG, and motion capture. Uh, you have you know, interaction between someone who's actually on set in makeup uh, interacting with something that's not there or interacting to, with someone that's in a motion capture suit. Well, if it's not my favorite trio of lunatics. <laughs> motion capture basically records the movement of whatever the sensors are hooked to. They gave me a neoprene suit because I have all of these electronic uh, things on that uh, help uh, sense where, where my body is. So when Crispin's performing and he's doing a scene, all those mannerisms, all the hand gestures and all the body language is all being recorded. And then that's applied to the animation of the armor. And then that's put together with his head. It is Crispin Glover's real head on a computer-generated body, but moving just like Crispin Glover's body really did when we were shooting on stage. I've never worked so extensively with green screen before, and it is something that seeps into your brain <laughs> by the end of the day. The green screen vibe is not a very friendly vibe, so you want to keep it moving and keep things going as much as possible. So I'm of this kind of entire world of green, and I'm wearing green, and it's a, an odd feeling. I don't quite know how he navigates everything, because he's on stilts, and he's got one eye, because he wears an eye patch, and he's in the leotard, poor fellow. It's my crown, and I, the eldest! Jabberwocky! A similar thing with uh, the Red Queen, where you know, she's an all live action character, but we're doing some things. We're taking her head and increasing it by 50 to 75% of its normal size. I think probably my head's been growing for some time. You know, there's a, probably a tumor in there. and It's been pressing on the bit that controls the emotions. You know, it wasn't just as much as enlarging her head, but her neck goes along for that ride as well. So you can imagine if you turn a person profile and you enlarge their head and their neck, their, their neck would no longer fit on their shoulders. So what we had to do is some pretty intricate tapering of the neck and the jawline to kind of get it to fit back into this, this design collar. The subtleties of blending her head into her normal size body has been uh, difficult, but it looks really interesting. So you kind of say, all right, what's great about that is it takes you to a mid-ground point, which is a real person, but 
manipulated and slightly mutated, so not quite real. And it's like this missing link between the CG world and Alice, who's always normal looking, even if she's 20 feet tall. Bandersnatch is a pure 100% CG character. He's kind of a half bulldog and half grizzly bear. Totally made up character, never really seen anything like it before. Our goal was to go with a slightly more naturalistic approach to the animation. Bandersnatch is particularly problematic because his fur is so long. To get all of the sort of like fine details um, to get something that looks, you know, just fantastic um, is computationally very, very expensive. You know, for a creature that is this large and what it's supposed to do, we want to get little, you know, subtle details in emotion. So we are going to start adding in, like, you know, drool coming out of the mouth. Um, to make it feel like he's really kind of wincing at that moment. Well, he's got to feel like it's really squishing into the eye socket. It kind of hurts a little bit when he shoves it in there. Each of those things kind of helps just get a, a sense of realism into the image. Every little, you know, bit just keeps adding a layer of complexity. It's uh, the most important thing, I guess, it's that it has a soul. That it's not, uh, it's artificial, but it shouldn't look like that. Who is this Absalom? He's wise. He's absolute. He's Absalom. And then there's two fun characters, which are Tweedledee and Tweedledum. You know, the Tweedles were always my favorites in the, in the books. I always uh, adored them. I thought uh, there's no human that can be that sort of funny or cute or sweet or bizarre. Um, and Tim found him, Matt Lucas. Hello there, friend. How you doing? All right. I've put on a little bit of weight recently. Can you tell? No. Yeah. The way we have to photograph them is Matt Lucas plays both characters. He has another person, his double, that's working with him, who's also in this kind of teardrop-shaped green suit. And they play off each other. So they can interact, they can, they can have dialogue back and forth. But what we do is as soon as we've shot Matt as D and Ethan as Dumb, we then have to switch the roles and Matt has to play the opposite character. We do a few takes as one Tweedle and then we swap. And so you have to remember your timing and things like that. So it, it, it does require a, a great degree of concentration. And so then what we end up doing is we take the two performances of Matt Lucas and we end up splitting those two performances together to create one master plate. And that's used as our reference for our animation. And eventually what we will end up doing is take that performance of Matt Lucas' face and we'll, what we're calling it face pasting. We'll take that performance and actually stick it onto the CG character so you'll have this CG uh, computer generated character with Matt Lucas's actual face integrated into it. It was a lot of pieces and puzzling, putting things together, and in a weird way, kind of like a Polaroid photo, like you really don't see a shot materialize until the very end. It's a nice blend of the worlds, I think, to help you just kind of believe everything you're seeing. My job is to make sure that the action and the fight sequences are performed in a safe and interesting manner. When they give you the script, we break it down. We have to figure out how we're going to perform some of these stunts. All sorts of interesting ideas that were on the script were brought forward. It's our job to figure out how we're going to shoot it. You think the Jabberwocky's here, right? Then you have a testing phase, a rehearsal phase, where you put a stunt person out there, have them do the action, you videotape it, and you show the director, and he gives his input back. Go ahead, go look at it, you don't see the and then you go back and rehearse it one more time until you have it precisely ready to shoot with. Oh, oh, and great. It's an incredibly physical role. <laughs> I never imagined it to be that physical. Even something like jumping into a pocket or crawling off a hat onto a shoulder is a stunt. Go! We had Mia up on a wire and a harness. Come on yeah. back down. Perfect. It Good. Get anymore. All right, let's go ahead and hook her up. Wearing the harness was kind of a difficult thing to do because I had to be under the costumes a lot. And I had to be in it quite often. And as much fun as it is to be flying through the air, which that was, you know, one of my favorite things, it's like a really kind of painful thing to be in for a long time. I 
I want you to really try to get it in there as deep as you can. One of the hard things about sword fighting is that it's, it's not something that you can learn in a couple of hours. It it's kind of requires a lot of strength, you know, particularly in your wrists and in your arms and your, you know, your whole upper body. You know, this movie has got so many great elements. We had someone ride a dog, rode a hat, you know, do a sword fight. We have some amazing action in this movie. Why is it you're always too small or too tall? It's so frustrating being a different size in the film. It is really frustrating having to be, you know, eight feet tall and then six inches. You know, I have to be on platforms. A lot of the time I have to have different eye lines, so there's a lot of acting to sticky tape and to tennis balls. The weird thing about this material is that she's very rarely the normal height, and again, it's kind of like awkward growing pains, you know, it's kind of experiencing that on a physical level. Been growing an awful lot lately. Well, if you've got Alice when she's, for example, eight foot six tall, with her eye line there is at seven feet 11, and she's talking to the Hatter, they've got to be looking in the correct attitude. So we built uh, little platforms to raise the actors up. An old movie trick is, is called a man maker, which was an eight inch block. You could put a row of them along, look big and tall. So on this show, we've got Tweedle makers and Stain makers and Alice makers, and they're all at various heights. And then Ken's guys at Sony will expand Alice around her eyes. Traditionally, in most effects films, you'd say, well, we'll shoot the Hatter and we'll move him out, and then we'll shoot Alice. Now, sometimes we have to do that. Other times when there's a lot of close interaction between the characters or it's a really emotional scene, I tried to do it all in one. So the Hatter's there with Alice, except she's eight and a half feet tall, but she's got her hands around his face and she's talking to him. And I absolutely did not want to break that up. It wouldn't have been the same performances from either person. That's better. You look yourself again. The fun part of being different sizes is being able to film in a teapot or, or film on a set where there's a giant table and, you know, a key that's this big that you can hold like, you know, a weapon or something. Try this on the side. It's only a dream. My name is Joan Spittler, and I'm one half of the Cake Divas. We got a phone call from the prop master, and he came by. He was like, can you do this? I was like, yeah, of course, we could do this. Can't we? <laughs> you know? For me, as a baker, it's like a dream job. You're all late for tea! We were lucky enough to work on some of the key tea items from England in the Victorian times. We made little baby two-tier fruit cakes, pies, fruit tarts, little scones. Pass the scones, please. I just remember the prop master looking at me and saying, now, look at this table and memorize it, because once this scene is over and it's, it's completely demolished, you're gonna have to reset it. And it was like, so much detail. We had to reset that table about 12 times within five to 10 minutes, that's it. The thing that I am most proud of is the eat me cake. I physically had to practice writing eat me so that I could recreate it exactly each time. And then we have the challenge of creating it to scale for the baby set. Are we gonna like get one of them blades with a magnifying glass and write eat me? And Joan said, yeah, kinda. So we did. There is an actual eat me cake recipe. You know, I did a lot of research and tried different really old fashioned recipes. And we ended up with the very traditional old Victorian recipe that was a brown sugar molasses cake. We also had to make sure that it was edible for the actor to eat because she was doing multiple takes. Not all of it. So she was biting into that 30 times. This is fondant. It's a sugar dough made out of corn syrup and powdered sugar. 
Fondant is great under camera lights because it doesn't tend to sweat. That's a, why they use it in England too, because it, it kind of keeps the cake in this shell form. It doesn't have the moisture or butter content that a traditional buttercream might have. If you did a traditional wedding cake and put it in front of the lights, it would just melt away. Would you have any more of that cake that made me grow before? I don't know that the Eat Me Cake will be a cake diva specialty. I kind of will reserve that for Alice and Tim Burton and this whole experience. It's like being a part of history, that we were able to help make it a reality. <laughs> I'm just so happy to do it. They're all late for tea! <laughs> the tea party in Alice in Wonderland is probably the iconic scene. And we took that challenge to the next level, which is come up with a look of not just the characters, but the way the table is laid out. There's a bit more of a depression over this particular tea party. Like having tea in a wartime period, and they were doing the best they could in difficult circumstances. It's a hodgepodge of cutlery and, and dishware and tables that don't line up. And sort of all that little cattywampus angles and mismatched chairs, mismatched china. <laughs> and we augmented it with, you know, various leaves and berries to make it look like they had been at the tea party for quite a while and they weren't so tidy and there was tea stains. You know, it's our goal to provide the highest quality, the most authentic thing that we can. But those things exist only in museums. So we have to sort of photograph that, look at it from every angle, and try and do that real thing justice. And somehow it created this unique look, and it fit the characters. I like it. The Mad Hatter steps up, and he just walks all the way from one end all the way across the other, stepping through food, and he's freaking China. And the logistics of that, of like, clearing off all the smashed food, because we had big cakes and pies and, you know, scones and pastries and things that, you know, once you step in it, you know, it kind of follows you down the table. We got three of everything. Doug got breakaway pieces. And then very quickly, uh, we had the painters try and match those breakaway pieces as best as we could to the pieces that we had found all over. And there's, I'd say, maybe 150 pieces on the table for the actors and for everyone to see a tangible, beautiful thing like that. It's so important when you're working in a green environment to have a real thing there becomes everyone's focus because it's the only real thing there. It just sort of really came together and it's fantastic. Goodbye. <laughs>